Welcome to episode number 83 of the Canadian Prepper Podcast. We are recording September the 6th, 2020. My name's Eric. I'm the host of the show based in Southern Ontario. I'm a hunter, target shooter, ham radio operator, and computer geek. As a first responder, I witnessed an over-reliance on emergency services during major events, and I started a small preparedness company to help people get prepared for at least 72 hours, if not longer. Uh, I'm Alan. I'm a safety trainer, first responder, security expert, also a ham radio operator, and overall safety nerd. I'm Hughes from Nova Scotia. I'm a Canadian Armed Forces veteran, volunteer firefighter and station chief, also a volunteer search and rescue technician and prepper, and I've been preaching and living the prepper lifestyle to varying degrees for the last six years or so. My name is Andrew. I'm a recovering libertarian, a firearms instructor at Ragnarok Tactical, and you can normally find me complaining about the government on Canadian Patriot Podcast. All right. If you want to help support the show and keep the uh, Canadian Prepper Podcast on the air, you can buy a Canadian Prepper Podcast t-shirt at prepperpodcast.ca. You can also visit prepperpodcast.ca slash support to see our Amazon products that we recommend or sign up, become a Patreon. All proceeds help keep the lights on and the backup generator fueled. If you are enjoying the show, please take a few moments and like us on Facebook, submit a review on iTunes. We also want your feedback, good, bad, indifferent, or even if there's just a topic you want us to cover, you can email us at feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. So we've got some uh, decrypting content for you in this episode. We're going to start off with some preparedness-related news. Next, we'll let you know what we've done for our preparedness since the last episode. Then we're going to get into the main topic, protection from cyber attack. Let's move into some news. Uh, Not a lot of detail on this particular one. The uh, article that I put in the notes for tonight, um, quadruple murder suicide apparently in Oshawa. Um, Sounds like somebody showed up that wasn't welcome and now a whole bunch of people are dead. Um, Keep your friends closer, enemies closer. And what's the old saying? Be polite, be professional, have a plan to kill everyone you meet. Something like that. Yeah. Jeez. And so we seem to have lost Hughes, so we'll move on. I've got a couple of news articles here. He's come back. So I've got a couple of news articles, uh, a couple in regards to CRA. So if you've been paying attention to the news last uh, couple of weeks, uh, they were hacked. So uh, a lot of people have found uh, their accounts were shut down. Um, Some perpetrators were able to fraudulently acquire about 9,000 of the 12 million uh, GC key accounts, and then separately also attack the CRA system uh, by using credential stuffing attacks. So uh, those who aren't uh, familiar with credential stuffing, they will take usernames and passwords obtained from previous hacks uh, and use them in an attempt to gain access to other accounts. Uh, So CRA was shut down for a little bit. Apparently they're back up and online again, and they've um, secured things. We'll see how long that lasts before they're hacked again. seems to be a thing. It's almost as if a central depository of all of our really valuable information is a bad idea. Weird, right? And had another article here. Uh, so COVID-19 scammers are uh, changing tactics as the pandemic stretches on. They're uh, offering uh, Canadian targets help with previous pandemic data breaches. So they're offering to help you clean up a breach from previous, but really they're just looking to gain your information again. Well, that's swell yeah that's nice of them but uh you know at least they're they're getting crafty with it but i don't know the cra calls me a couple days and tells me that i'm wanted i'm still here i genuinely appreciate that they're actually putting some effort into it you know that's that makes me happy yeah i like pressing one and chatting with them for a while and then they get really mad and call (laughs) me a few names and then they hang up it's a good time i feel like i've wasted their time when they haven't been able to scam someone else for that 10 minutes i've been perfect setting them up I like that. That's a good theory anyways. Yeah. Um, what else we got? Is that for news articles? Where did McKay go? Right, I've, got a, I've got a news article here oh, if yeah, uh, right. Hughes isn't right. back. Um, customer complains about delays after ransomware attack on delivery company Canpar Express. Canpar Express is, of course, a subsidiary of Canpar. They are a courier service. And uh, last week, the the week of the, uh, the 21st, they... Uh, Temporarily suspended some of their operations because they couldn't sort packages. It's a bit of an issue. It does make it hard to be a courier yeah. company when you can't put the boxes onto trucks. No. Yeah, it's kind of a an important part of the process. So they were down for, I think they were down for about two or three days, um, but it impacted pretty well all of eastern Canada. Like anything east of Ontario got affected. 
The question is, did they pay the ransom or did they have backups? Uh, for well, reasons here, that I can't discuss, that. I <laughs> understand that the systems were rebuilt. They were not ah, uh, they were not restored from backups, but they were rebuilt. Excellent. Good. Good to hear they at least had some good systems in place. It took a couple days to get it back. Well, but they knew who to call time. eventually. Fair enough. Was it Ghostbusters? Mm. Mm. It's not Ghostbusters. I'm yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. For, for legal reasons, it was definitely Ghostbusters. Excellent. Slimer can uh, fix ransomware for sure. Why not? Yeah. All right, Hughes, you. Uh, you I did. I'm. I'm back. Yeah, we were talking uh, about uh, spotty internet before the show, and sure enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, so peak of hurricane season is this week. Uh, so typically, uh, September 10th is uh, kind of the mean. Uh, in the season, and I guess there's two tropical depressions that are currently forming in the Atlantic. Um, this obviously affects uh, people along the eastern seaboard of the United States, as well as the Canadian um, Atlantic provinces. So uh, that's uh, one of the things that got me into preparedness, because we kept getting uh, hit with uh, small hurricane and tropical storms and all that stuff. Um, so it's good to know that we're halfway through, but um, we're only halfway through the battle as well. So just some, some something to keep an eye on for all the folks on the East Coast. Good to know. I mean, Florida really should be doing its part to flatten the curve. Didn't they like try and shoot at some tor- at some hurricanes at one point to <laughs> dissipate them? I think that was Texas, right? Texas. I think they were, yeah, they were shooting at tornadoes in order to try to yeah. stop. Yeah, them, so. so I mean, that's that's I mean, flatten the curve, right? We're at the if we're yeah, at the yeah. peak, then we should be uh, we should be on the right side of that now. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I that's 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 I can muster for the news <laughs> for today. <laughs> All right, well then, let's move into what we've done lately for preps. Uh, so for myself, uh, I ripped out all the drywall and the uh, little built out that was around our sump pit area, uh, battled with a whole bunch of mold that I found in behind the drywall and the vapor barrier. So that was a ton of fun. Uh, but now ready for the professionals to come in and, and put the new pump system in. Um, some jobs are just better left to the professionals as much fun as it would be to, to get a jackhammer in and start ripping up a floor and such. Uh, I figured I'd just bring in the pros to do it. So, So it's ready to go. And I started exploring our, our own little backyard here. Um, so we're finding all kinds of different hiking trails and little areas to explore that uh, never really knew were here before. And they're all within five or 10 minutes of the house. Uh, so we're trying to make a point to find somewhere new or something new in and around the area each day and start exploring instead of you know, traveling 20 minutes, half hour away. We're looking at uh, what's actually basically within walking distance. So it's been fun. It's been about a week or two of doing that and finding all kinds of neat little spots. I had no idea existed. Oh, that is a good time. Yeah. Um, I discovered a fairly significant drainage issue with my own sump pumps, uh, which resulted in me digging a big hole in my yard uh, to make a weeping pit. Um, that was Friday, and I still can't lift my arms over my shoulders. Uh, so essentially, we've got my, my yard is all clay. So it's not only is it clay, but it was wet clay, uh, which was exceptionally heavy and very difficult to uh, very difficult to move around. But now I've got a big hole that has a lot of gravel and lots of places for it to go. Um, now I'm planning to do the same thing in the front yard, which is going to get me uh, an excuse to rent a mini X and have some fun digging. Um, also started training in jujitsu this week after a year of talking about it. So we're um, going to get, uh, funny enough, I have a hard time finding people to spar with. Um, they don't want to take on the giant, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Uh, but it's been a ton of fun and a uh, great learning experience. It's something that's been recommended to me over and over again, and I will highly recommend it to everybody around me now. Nice. Uh, so, but Hughes, I've anything been... on the list? Oh, sorry, Andrew. Go, Go ahead. ahead, Hughes. Sure, yeah. So most Canadian I, um... standoff ever. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to do a lot in terms of prep, um, just kind of trying to get the most out of summer, uh, squeeze them before the kids start back in school on Tuesday. But um, I've been readying some supplies to winterize the RV, uh, which is going to be happening in a few weeks, as well as getting ready for duck and deer hunting season, which is going to be uh, starting in a couple of weeks here. So, um, And then after that, I'll kind of dive into the climate-specific preps as far as getting ready for winter. So stay tuned for that. Uh, that's all I have for this week. All right, try again, Andrew. All right, I've been doing a whole bunch of shooting of late. I'm putting on a monthly partisan rifle contest at uh, my local gun club at Guelph Rod and Gun. And I'm also putting on a monthly service pistol match at Guelph Rod and Gun. And we have 
lots of people coming out and obeying the various COVID-related social distancing policies and shooting rather well. And I'm I'm tending to turn up in the top couple of shooters. It helps that I wrote the rule book, I imagine. That would help. Yep. But uh, yeah, do it doing well with that. We got lots of people coming out. We got lots of people bringing out lots of different, not yet prohibited rifles, enjoying themselves and shooting bullseye targets. And uh, lately, I've uh, I've turned to making beer. That was my adventure today. I made uh, two three gallon batches. I did a Hefeweizen and a uh, a milk chocolate stout that both look Ooh. lovely in their carboys. And I can see the little yeasties doing their thing and making alcohol. The pictures you sent just did a, look good. Just another three weeks until I can move on to the next step. <laughs> that would be the worst part. <laughs> the waiting has the to be the worst no, part. The, 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 the waiting. And it's not even three weeks until I can drink it. It's literally three weeks until I can go to the next step in the fermentation process. Uh, so I'm probably <laughs> five or six weeks away from beer, but that that's uh, okay. Well, I trust have you have some in reserve. A uh, little, little bit. I... Uh, Stopped by one of the local microbreweries and picked up a Labor Day sale that they were doing because it's important to fuel yourself while you're making the beer. Well, I think I it's think a so. requirement. Like you, you don't shop on an empty stomach and you don't make beer when you're sober, right? Yeah. That sounds I, fair. I, I mean, accept- this is true. Yeah. Works for me. I, I usually split my time between uh, reloading in the garage and making beer because most of what making beer is actually just drinking and watching water boil. So I usually turn my back on it and stand in front of the reloading press for a bit. That works. Sure. I I actually cleaned out our local CCI distributor this week. I said, I will take all of the small pistol primers that you have. And it turns out that I could drive away with that many. I mean, barely, but I could drive away with that many. So perfect. Yeah. Sorry to everybody else that wanted small pistol primers. (laughs) You're all out of luck. Nah, (laughs) you snooze, you lose. Don't be be sorry for being right. (laughs) All right, well, let's move into the main topic of the show. So we're talking about cybersecurity, cyber attack. Uh, normally in the preparedness community, it's always talk about, you know, growing your vegetable garden, growing your herbs, uh, protecting your home, um, all that kind of stuff. You, you don't hear a lot about preparing or preventing cyber attack. And really, it, it's it's been a thing since the Internet, obviously. Uh, but it, it really hasn't been a big mainstream thing in the media except for I'd say within the last five, five, 10 years where people are using it more and more, more personal information is coming onto the internet. Uh, so people are obviously more concerned about it. And the target has kind of shifted from big, huge corporations with lots of data to sometimes a smaller guy uh, because you have all your information and chances are you don't have all the big security um, budget or, or thought or mindset as a big corporation would have. So we thought we'd put an episode together uh, and talk about it this evening and uh, kind of get some information out there to help everybody get a little bit better prepared, have their data a little bit more secured, and hopefully help uh, prevent this from happening to you. Uh, Because we're all interconnected in today's society. Everybody, for the most part, has a cell phone, internet. Uh, Your ATM is all based on internet connection or connectivity now. Your paycheck is probably electronically deposited. Uh, Power grid, uh, traffic lights, all of them are, are, are connected or, or somehow controlled by computer systems. Just to name a few things. So cyber attacks are happening all the time. I've put a couple of links in the show notes here that uh, are some threat maps that'll show you active attacks that are happening. Uh, one is FireEye and one is threatmap.checkpoint.com. Uh, again, they're in the show notes. You can check them out. It's a live interactive map that'll show you different various types of attacks that are happening in real time. Uh, kind of neat to watch. And uh, you can see them all happening within the U.S., within Canada, hopping over to China, hopping from China over to Canada, U.S. Uh, so it's something to kind of just watch, and and you can put it up in your background if you want to look impressive at some point. And it makes for a great presentation if you're in uh, the tech uh, tech industry. Uh, so the idea of a personal cyber attack is usually far from most, like I said, in the prepper uh, community. Uh, mostly the concern lays with uh, banks, power grid going down. Uh, but have you ever considered what would happen if, say, your email was hacked, uh, your medical records, your your bank account, your cell phone, uh, your personal identification, if it leaked? I now kind what? of hope my bank account gets hacked, and then the people that do it feel bad for me and help. That would be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna attack, if you're gonna attack anybody's bank account, mine is probably not the one to go after. <laughs> 
Yeah, that would be great if all of a sudden one day you, you logged into your online banking and there's, you know, a couple million in there. It's just I'm like sure. an email from somebody that's like... Felt really bad for you. We, we felt really bad for you. We were going to stake your money, but you obviously need it more than we do. So. Yeah, so here you go. We hacked some other guy and here's some of his money. That'd be great. I don't think that's, that's my current retirement plan. So all of you hackers out there, if you, uh, <laughs> if you feel the need. All right. Good to know. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll put your bank account number up in uh, the end of the show here for anybody that wants it. Uh, so like I said, most of your personal information is on electronics. Um, you know, not, not having a plan to protect your personal information. You may even have your entire preparedness plan electronically stored. Uh, it's just doing your preps an injustice. If you're leaving everything out in the open and available, people are going to start looking into it and they're going to start to want to glean that information and, and use it for most likely nefarious things, not putting thousands of dollars into your bank account. They're going to try and take it out. Uh, so just a couple of stats. Uh, between 2010 and 2018, there were 10.11 incidents of ID theft per 100,000 residents in Canada. Uh, between 2008 and 2019, uh, there were over 9,600 reports of data breaches in the USA. Um, I threw that in there because a lot of Canadians will use US-based services online. Um, so the data breaches do also affect us here in Canada. Um, the joys of the internet, everybody's interconnected and uh, borders tend to kind of disappear. Um, November 1st of last year, uh, businesses became subject to new mandatory breach reporting regulations under Canada's federal private sector privacy law. Uh, the the uh, Personal Information Protected, Protection and Electronic Documents Act uh, requires organizations to report when there's been significant data breaches and, and data leaks of uh, information. Um, so the Office of the Privacy Commissioner uh, between November 2018 and, and October 2019 reported eight no, sorry, 680 data breaches. So out of those reports, 147 were accidental disclosure. Uh, 82 of them were just simple loss. So the companies lost the hard drive with the data on it or lost the thumb drive. Uh, they don't know where it is. Uh, 54 were theft, but 397 were unauthorized access. So someone's gained access to that information without any sort of authorization whatsoever. So they've found a way into the system and, and taken the information. Um, ID theft, something to think about. Everybody always thinks, yeah, okay, I'm an adult. My identification could potentially be stolen and used, uh, you know, take out mortgages, take out loans, pretend to be me and, and take out whatever kind of uh, information they want as far as banking or, or gain uh, some sort of service. But it is also actually popular to steal children's ID for, for identification theft. So make sure you're, you, you have that little chat with your, your kids as well as far as what they're sharing on the internet. So they share enough, somebody can take over their identification as well and, and start running around and pretending to be them. And that's not good if uh, all of a sudden there's mortgages in their names and such. So keep an eye out for that. That's someone with a question or no? Nope. Um, are there safeguards, say, at banks? Maybe somebody knows the answer to this for like my kid's ID. Like um, if somebody tries to use my, you know, my, my son's social social insurance number, he's 10. Is there any correlation between that number and a date of birth? I don't believe there is with the SIN number. Basically, no. Could be wrong. Okay. No. Yeah, I mean, I know my kids... Tied here. I know my three kids' SIN numbers, and there's, they have nothing to do with one another. Like, it's, it's not like you can derive age from it. Um, so I don't think that there would be. So just keep that information super secure because it can be used for anything regardless of the age of your kids. Yeah. There we go. And Gen generally posting Instagrams of your social insurance number card is like frowned upon. Yeah. 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 Now my, uh, my daughter just turned of an age where the internet is becoming more of a thing for her. And so um, she has a couple of, uh, she now has a couple of social media accounts and we have uh, very, very strict guidelines about what goes there. Um, there's an open phone policy like you are not allowed to you are not allowed to hide or delay um, discussions uh, so like if you have any messages we have access to them and um, yeah for that exact reason there's there's just too many people out there that might want to do bad things I'm sorry to hear that Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, a, that's an offline discussion that, uh, that I, I, need, I, I usually need a couple of beers to be able to talk about that now. So, yep. um, 
yeah, especially with your kids, because it's not that not that they would do anything intentionally, but they don't know the harm that they can do with the information that they have. Yeah, and they could very innocently be giving out an answer to the question that they don't realize is leading to more identification and more identification, and they might not even realize what that other person is asking for, or what it could potentially lead to. Um, so just can we talk about that part for a moment? Because you see this yeah. all the time on on the book of faces with the the quiz about. What's the last thing you ate? And 10 other fun facts about you, like where did you <laughs> yeah. grow up and what's your mother's maiden name? Uh, and can I have your postal code? Because that would all be really, really helpful for me to open a credit hmm. card in your own name. Yeah. Or, you know, I forgot my password and answer the following three recovery questions. Yeah. That's a classic well, that's kind of social engineering at. attack, right? Yep. But so many people do that, do those chain letter things on Facebook where it's like, yeah. well, answer these 20 questions. And it's like, okay, but like five of those are commonly used by banks as password recovery tools. Yep. So, like, stop posting the name of your your beloved first dog on on Facebook, <laughs> and the color yes. of your first car, and your mother's <clears throat> maiden. Name. Yep. It's uh, and, and those are all things that are developed to look like a fun game, and you don't even think about it. And all of a sudden, I'm sure there's a few listeners now going, "Uh oh, how do I delete that?" Yeah. But how about it, stop it, using those as recovery questions too? I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. Any, anytime you have the option to write your own recovery question, you should do that. Or have a system yeah. where you know that the question is going to be, what was the color of your first car? And then come up with a different answer, like the name of your favorite book or something. It, change it up. Yeah. The, yeah, the system doesn't care. The problem is being able yeah. to remember all that stuff. Because if you write yeah. all of this down, particularly in a digital format, yep. you're not really doing yourself any favors. No. And if you write it all on paper, you're probably still not doing yourself any favors because when I break into your house and steal your notebook and it says, you know, chase bank account number <laughs> and recovery questions. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Physical security is also a thing. Yo, yes. Or if you're like me, you'll go looking for that book and you don't know where you put it. You put it in a very safe place. <laughs> yes. You don't probably even remember with where a passport. Place. That's where mine would be. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> related news. If you happen to see my passport, I've been looking for yeah. it. <laughs> question, question to the panel. Um, pro, no, sorry, two-part question. One, um, securing your phone, is it better to secure an iPhone or an Android? Or is there an advantage to one over the other? And two, if you are pass, password locker apps uh, actually secure in any way, or what's the best way to to do that, to deal with that? Uh, well, let's, let's start with the OS one, I think. The OS one is easy. Yeah. Neither of them is a good option. Nope. How much do you trust Apple? How Not much do you trust Google? Yeah. Even less. Right. So well, which, which one of the, the two is the better option? Well, yeah. So between between them, which is the least bad, I guess, is the best question. That is the real question. I, mm. I'm going to hesitate to argue in favor of Android being a more secure option in that it can be vetted by third parties. But even then, every... Every cellular carry makes their own modifications to it, as do hardware manufacturers. So your your Samsungs and your Huawei's and your your phone hardware manufacturers implement their own subsystems, like additional software on top of the Android OS. So while Android itself is theoretically more secure than iOS, it's not really. So maybe put is it a this fair way. assessment. If you're Eric? I would look look at the hardware too. I mean, um, if you're going to go Android, I w I would probably personally say stick with Google or Samsung. I I wouldn't go Huawei just because of the concerns that um, yeah. are around the Chinese giant that owns it. Um, I did hear though from a lot of a lot of sources that iOS seems to be harder to get in, um, but that's that's just what I've heard. So I will not professionally confirm nor deny that. <laughs> Um, however, yes, uh, Android access to Android is or can be depending on the phone and the manufacturer and and a, a whole myriad of, of things with the the design of the device can at times be easier to gain access to if you have physical access to the device versus an Apple phone six digit pin lock on it. Depending if your if your pin code is one two three four five six, well. And I think it's things too, if you look at, um, like my Samsung device has an SD card 
Um, I have the ability to uh, encrypt that SD card, but a lot of people don't do that. So even if somebody were to gain access to your phone and not have the ability to get into the phone, they can still have access to everything that's on the SD card because more often than not, those SD cards are, are not encrypted and they can contain a lot of information when it comes to pictures. Those pictures can create can contain geo geotags, um, so where they were taken. So that gives them information as to where you go, uh, places you visited. It can contain all your downloads. Those downloads could be pay stubs, could be personal yeah. documents, could be anything, right? So that's definitely a concern when it comes to um, Android devices because iOS doesn't have SD cards. Everything is built into the phone's uh, memory, right? So. Basically, what it boils down to is if somebody gets physical access to your device and they have the ways and means to gain access to it, they are going to eventually get access. It's just a matter yeah, of becomes knowing a time how. Problem. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. So, Given enough time eventually. And yep. I mean, that's true of your, your encrypted devices too, whether it's your SD card from your phone <clears> or your, your encrypted external hard drive that you carry in your, in your briefcase. Yep. It, the encryption really depends. So if you, if your passcode is one two three four, my rainbow tables do not take long to execute one two three four because people that do this professionally just have all of the math already done in advance in things like rainbow tables, where I just have terabytes worth of pre-calculated hashes that I can run against a device to try and gain access. So as long as I don't have like a limited number of attempts, or as long as I can't bypass the limited number of attempts, or there's a lot of it's a lot of so, ways and means. So, so tell me then, Andrew, I'm just going to jump to um, password managers for a second because I use um, LastPass, for, for example, um, and I get LastPass to create all my passwords. And typically those are minimum 24 characters if if I'm allowed to. So I'll, oftentimes websites will have a, a minimum of like eight characters or 12 characters. Um, I personally do a minimum of 24 and it's like, you know, alphanumerical, capital, special characters. Um, how good is your rainbow table at decrypting like a 24 character randomly generated password, for example? Not going to be good. Rainbow tables are generally pre-calculated hashes based on dictionary attacks. So okay. rather than me having to like run the dictionary, I can do like all of the letter and combinations before and after with common substitutions and things like one, two, three, four and five, four, three, two, one, and all of those and it's all pre-calculated hashes that I can run against my my target device or my my target encryption. And there okay. are different kinds of encryptions, but generally, uh, longer is better, as with most things. Wow. And uh, variety is also good, as with most things. <laughs> yes. So if you're using, um, if you're using the random generated password twenty four character that like gobbledygook, like it's yeah. all letters and symbols. Yeah. Then it's going to be. It can be broken, but I mean, uh, like an really SHA, gonna want access. yeah, like 24 characters SHA is going to take me like 400 years to try every combination, give or take, if I try one so combination every one-tenth of a concern. second. <laughs> the, no, the weak, no, like I say, longer is better. The weak yeah. point in your last pass is the master password. Right. And so, you know, my master password is 36 characters, which sounds excessive, but it's something I, 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 I remember I can type yeah. fairly quickly. Well, the entire um, alphabet so I understand. Nine. Like, that's really not <laughs> that it's the alphabet twice, guys. Uh, no, but I understand that that's the, the limitation. So, you know, I have a 36 character password. I have 2FA set up for LastPass as well, which I know is not... Uh, you know, it, 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 2FA doesn't mean that somebody can't get into it, but there's ways to make 2FA more secure than others. Like, you know, don't use um, text messaging for your t for your 2FA code because somebody could clone your SIM card and get that text message and, you know, um, so those things like, like that. But yeah, I think that the reason why I went with something like LastPass is because I knew that if one of, like, if I was using the same password uh, for every site, even if it was complicated, if that if one of those sites was compromised and they had my email address, they had um, what Eric referred to as like a stuffing um, type of attack, I guess. Whereas yeah, you know, if, if I have sixty or hundred sites that I'm on, once they have my one password, they have every password. As it stands, yeah. you know, if they have one password, that's it. They've only yeah. got that one password. Well, and so. let's let's make that a good point. If you're going to have more than one service, you should have more than one password. Um, much like how if you have like a bank card, like an ATM card and a credit card, you probably don't want those to be the same pin. You don't want your email and your electrical bill and your lab results and your all of your various services online to be, you know, 
super cool firefighter guy one two three four because can you not say my password please yeah. <laughs> ah, <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> apologies no one yeah. two um, three four five that's the kind of code an idiot has in his luggage <laughs> so uh last pass i think is good key pass one uh one password there's a bunch of those services um last pass is good we've i've done a bunch of testing with a bunch of these and they are all pretty industry standard, but I mean, it, it is a weak spot in that if I can gain access to that, I can gain access to everything. Yep. Right. I mean, what I use with my last pass is a YubiKey uh, 2FA. So um, unless you get your hands on that YubiKey, then theoretically you shouldn't be able to access that password. I no, right? and so. two-factor authentication is definitely going to make things uh, more more secure for you. Uh, two factor, not that it can't be broken, but I mean, two factor is generally going to make it a lot harder for me as an attacker to find a, a threat vector that I can use to have my way with your data. Um, if I have physical access to your device, you're you're kind of boned. But as right. long as I don't physically have access, you're probably okay. M maybe yeah. there are some attacks, like if I spoofed a SIM card, I could maybe pick up a pick that up, See. or if I had it. And it was a code that went to your email and I had your device and I could see your email. I might be able to get that. Like, so there's, there's definitely some two factor stuff that's flawed, but if you're using a, a separate physical device and I'm, I'm pretty much SOL unless I have the device. Yeah. yeah it's always nice to have that if secondary you, device. Um, with LastPass too, is you can restrict mobile de de devices, meaning that a mobile device can't access your account unless you actually go in and, and authorize it. Um, I've done so by MAC address. I've blocked access to countries um, and all that kind of stuff, right? So there's ways to secure um, um, products. Yeah, and LastPass is really good for that because you can do the you can do the geofencing, you can do uh, MAC isolation. Yeah, but and I, I did that, and then I traveled to Singapore, and I forgot that I did that, <laughs> and I had to VPN back into Canada in order to unrestrict myself. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. yeah, so yeah, there are there are drawbacks to doing, but generally it's going to be more secure. But like. Anything else when you travel, there are there are some steps you have to take. Yeah. And not forget and, and realize once you get there that you haven't taken them. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the other thing I want to bring up with the uh, the uh, secure operating systems, because I mean, my my concern is as much um, non-state actors it is, as it is a, a malicious third party. So the fact that Apple could, in theory decrypt any iPhone they wanted to. I don't know how easy it is to compel Apple to do that, but I feel like it would be a lot harder to compel somebody like Google and Samsung to decrypt a device because you have the potential for more people to be involved and it becomes more onerous on a, um, let's call them an extra governmental agency. Yeah, it seems to me like there's been reports of um, in in the news of police agencies going to Apple and pleading with them to decrypt the device and, and they basically said flat out no. Um, I don't know how much yeah, they've said truth no. there is to those. Does that right. mean I don't they know how much you can't. Yeah, exactly. But there's a difference well, between saying, saying you can't, can't do something I... and not actually being able to do it. And that's my, uh, as someone who works in in, in software and, and computer stuff, there's a you, programmers are generally pretty lazy. There's usually ways to get into things, and they usually leave them open for themselves because they're lazy. Yep. Well, that's my so, concern with Apple being a closed source operating system. I mean, I fully believe that Apple has the ability to decrypt these devices, but at the same time, when they receive a lawful access request or court order to decrypt the device and they're not doing so, um, you know, it should give you some peace of mind, I guess. But at the same time, I guess it just depends on if you trust Apple or the government more. Yeah. Who, who, right. who do you think has the best interest in art? <laughs> Why are we still assuming those are two separate entities, really? Like, right. Yeah. right. So, just, uh, and also because they're saying publicly that they're not doing it, does it mean that they're actually not doing it, or does it mean that they're just saying publicly that they're not doing it? Yeah, they'll, they'll tell you the encryption keys are generated on device, and they never actually see them. Mm, I question that as well. But yeah, I, I don't know how much space I put into that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, because phones are kind of a ubiquitous thing, there are uh, there are actually other options aside from Android and uh, iOS. I oh, really? a product called Lineage OS, uh, also Replicant, which are open source de um versions of Android. So they are uh, more open source than Android is in that they don't have third party manufacturer or carrier software embedded in them. 
Um, there's also Graphene, and there's a couple of other um, Linux-based OSs that you can load on Android hardware. Uh, like Ubuntu Touch is a Ubuntu is a very common Linux distribution. They have a, a version that runs on Android hardware, or some like certain Android handsets. So if you're super duper paranoid, like yours truly, yep. you might want to look at something like Lineage, because then you can look at the source code if you feel super inclined, and you can sideload all your normal apps, and you can do a, you can do like ninety five percent of what you can do on your regular iPhone with no Google integration. It's not spying on you. Well, it be, it's anyway. probably spying on you less. Yeah, fair enough. Because your carrier, your theoretical yeah. manufacturer could have like a low-level hardware attack, although the odds of them executing that against a specific target is very, very improbable. Not to say they couldn't do it. It's just highly unlikely. Uh, the, the cost would be very high. Um, but you still have your carrier problem, and you still have all of your apps that could yeah. gather anything on your phone, because that's... That's part of the other problem with this is regardless of your operating system, whatever you put on the app, you, you know when you install something in uh, Tinder's grant like, access. do you next, grant next, access next, to next, all next, of your photos yes. and camera yeah. and uh, microphone and da, 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 and you click the accept button because you want to swipe right on your next match? <laughs> yeah, because you just, you just gave that app access to everything on your phone, like every photo, not just the photos you post on your dating all profile, of all of them. Yeah, but uh, I um, put that thing on up. Facebook that said that I do not give Facebook consent to reuse any of my information. Uh, there so, we go. Uh, well, I'm, I'm safe, very glad right? you did that. It does not yeah. help you in the least. No, the, the whole but it gives me something to laugh at in the morning. When you use a free product, you are the product. So if you're using Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, I don't care what service it is. If you're not paying for it, you are the product. Yep. Um, well, so, I mean, even, even if you are paying for it, Amazon is a great example of that. Hey, Alexa, can you play my favorite music? Oh, and you also are going to show me targeted ads, even though I'm already paying 100 and whatever dollars a year for Prime? Yep. Yeah. So if it's free, I mean, yes, you're definitely, they're getting something from it, probably advertising dollars, maybe reselling your data to somebody that wants to buy it and sell you targeted stuff. But they might also just be using it for their own internal marketing purposes. But in some way, you are paying for this, right? And I was thinking in the worms of in, in the world of like security too. Um, you know, if you're using a free VPN, you're the product as opposed to paying oh, for a VPN, yes. right? Um, so there's just those those things to consider. And, and just while we're on the topic of, of operating systems, kind of switching over to desktop operating systems. Um, like I run mainly Kali Linux. Um, I do have. Um, uh, a Mac OS for my work as well as a Windows PC. So I run all of them, but primarily I'm running off Kali Linux. Um, what are your thoughts on Mac OS on Windows 10? I mean, I'm not going to talk about XP or anything like that, but what are your thoughts on like the more mainstream op operating systems? Because most people probably haven't heard of Kali. Or, uh, right, so. uh, Kali's a fork of Debian, isn't it? Yep. It is, yeah. See, I, I, know, I know my Linux distros, <laughs> but... Um, I work in a Windows shop now. I, I used to work in a Mac shop. Um, I have used probably a dozen different Linux distributions over the years, and I still use a bunch to do very specific tasks. Um, they are not secure. It doesn't matter which one it is. The only way to make a computer secure is to not plug it into any other computers. It's very Battlestar Galactica. As soon as you network it, it will be attacked. Right, so unless, unless you have a, a brand new air gapped system, um, sorry, by air, air gapped, I mean like a system that's never been connected to a network, a, a system that is physically and logically isolated from other computers. Uh, that's the only way to keep the data on that system secure. And really the only way to do that is to really, really, really format it, do your, do whatever your task is, and then like physically destroy the drive. Right, that's really the only way to be secure about that. But that's going to be overkill for like ninety nine point nine, users, a yeah. bunch of nines or people. Yeah, but there are there are specific things where having an air gap system may be uh, may be valuable, or where you have a VM or a throwaway system that you can do specific tasks on. I wouldn't recommend that for like your day to day Facebook surfing or checking your bank or things like that. But when you uh, when you get that free device from a trade show and they give you a, a free USB drive that's got like a vendor logo on it, Don't I, I might take that yeah. to my throwaway system 
and use my throwaway to format it and make sure it's uh, free of any malware before I plug it into things that matter. Yep. So then for the average person, let's say they're running Windows 10, would you say just having a uh, fairly robust and secure password and ensuring that this encryption is turned on, even if you're using something like BitLocker, would probably be the way to go? For your average, user, uh, not your advanced I mean, user. yes, BitLocker is kind of a joke. If you're going to do encryption, I would use a, a real encryption product. Um, my choice as of right now is Veracrypt, uh, which is a fork of the old True, True Crypt, Crypt product. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, TrueCrypt, uh, the, the TrueCrypt product, uh, project died a couple years ago, but there's a, a very successful fork of that Veracrypt that's running. It's basically the same thing. Um, yeah, I would, I would run Veracrypt, um, or some equivalent complete disk encryption technology, because again, anything on your computer can be accessed. And if you plug it into the internet, everything on your computer will be accessed. So by, running disk by running full disk encryption you are at least going to make it more difficult should someone physically have access to that machine so bitlocker is i mean like a bare minimum right but that's so one of my concerns is i mean you know physical security in mind if somebody were to break into my house and steal my laptop when it's powered off and it were to have bitlocker encryption with a secure password that average Joe burglar is not going to be able to get into that lap laptop. What they're going to end up doing is basically take, taking that hard drive out of that laptop, putting in you know a hundred dollar SSD, and try to resell that laptop. They're yeah, not going to be able to gain it. access to it, right? Like so it. I, I think it depends on how concerned you are about your data. Like if you have your your prepper bug out USB key that has all of your family's copies of your electronic records. Like if you have everybody's birth certificates and SIN cards and copies of health cards and all of that. So, like I would be a lot more concerned about that yep. than like your regular like C drive with windows on it and your, your games and things. I, I do have that stuff, but it's, it's encrypted with very using hidden volumes and so on. So again, for the average Joe, it's plausible deniability. For the, <laughs> I yeah, like. for, the, for the average Joe, good luck yeah. um, is all I'm saying. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I do have that stuff, um, and there's there's absolutely nothing that's kept on the computers themselves. Um, you know, I've got I've got a fairly secure NAS uh, for that. I've got thumb drives as well. Like I said, using VeraCrypt and and all that for, kind of stuff. For so. your average user, turn on all the built-in things in your OS that are going to make it more secure. So in Windows, that's going to be things like complex passwords and BitLocker, because that's sort of in my mind that's sort of a bare minimum. Like it's what, better than nothing. adding things like. Right. Without going to learn how to install and use full disk encryption on a product like Veracrypt, BitLocker is going to make it harder for someone who wants to gain access to that device to gain access. It's not going to stop it, but it's going to make it more of a pain in my ass. Right. Would BitLocker I'd be Probably. concerned about state actors, but I'm not concerned about your average, you know, somebody right. steals my laptop from a yeah. coffee shop that deal, right? So... Yeah, that's probably yeah, gonna. I, I I get that. Yeah, I'll and I think Mac down. has a similar, right? They, they have do. a similar they have file, description file vault, utility. Yeah. Built-in oh, description. Right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's that file yeah. vault two right now, and it's on by default if you've recently purchased a Mac. Uh, if you've got a, a a Mac that's a couple of years older, not on by default, but it's literally just in preferences, flipping over file vault encryption, and then it just, as Mac likes to say, it just works. And for the most part, gone are the days of this being software rendered encryption. A lot of it has, yeah. you know, built in hardware encryption, which means that it's it's really seamless to, to the user. It doesn't really affect yeah. the speed or raw performance of the system. So Yeah, you won't even notice it's on for most of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So go with that. Go with a complex yeah. password. Go with whatever level of encryption your <clears throat> OS allows. So me uh, Mac being, versus Windows is the same as like iOS versus Android. I'm not I'm not convinced that one is more secure than the other, but they just have different vectors of attack. Right. Me being average Joe, you know, my, my laptop has, you know, some pictures on it. It has a couple of important files that, you know, I keep backed up on a couple of USB drives and a that you know, one of them's in my safe, and one of them's in my safe deposit box, and I've got everything backed up in uh, Google Drive because it's easy to transfer files around. Um, my biggest threat is more like the random somebody trying to find my bank account information. Is that probably a safe assessment? 
That's so trying to find your bank information, trying to find your identity, um, anything they can use to pretend to be you is, is most likely what they're going after in your case. I don't think most would be interested in your family for, photos and such. I think that's true for most people, and, and your big vector for that is going to be phishing attacks, yep. uh, emails posing as something else, uh, password reset from msm.com as opposed to like <laughs> msn.com. Yep. But like... Because most people aren't going to catch small changes in long URLs or yep. two letters next to one another that look similar or an I in place of an L. So you laugh, but these you're are going to get what common and successful attacks. Oh, very much so. And that's what yeah. I mean. So you, you're going to get those kind of phishing attacks where some some uh, some third party sends you a password. Re you need to reset your Hotmail password, but it's actually Hotmail with two eyes. Yep. So you click on the link exactly and it looks like a Hotmail link and you type in your password and now they have your password because you just had to enter your old one and then your two new ones. Well, they don't care about the, the new one and the verification one. They just wanted the original. So thanks for putting your password. So be, be, be wary of clicking links in email. Uh, I think in general, be wary of clicking things in email. Yeah, period. Yeah. In, in general, email is not a safe and secure system. So you should no. be, I mean... Yeah. I would prefer we use like paper letters, but that's probably not practical. <laughs> well, 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 some, sometimes a letter gets, yeah. sometimes a letter will get across the province in sixteen hours, and sometimes a letter will get across the province in four days. Yeah. So it really depends on your on your level of urgency, really, more than anything. Yep. Yeah. So in terms of email, I would be I would be careful about phishing attempts, things that are masquerading as something that looks legitimate though it is not. Um, often so, redirects to other uh, other websites or redirects to uh, URLs with spelling errors in them, although they are not actually errors. It's just an attacker that's trying to make you think you're going to a legitimate website, and it's not. So uh, the other thing is that they can I, be... I was just going to say, with, with everything, I mean, you can get fancy with email, too. You can have, um, depending on who you're talking with, you can have PGP, you can have SMIME, um, you can have those levels of security added. Um, instead of using Gmail, you can use something like ProtonMail. Um, but again, it's not, if somebody sends you a phishing email to your proton mail account and you click on it you just it, it doesn't matter what service you're using at that point right so so the to me the the key takeaway there is if you didn't request a password change chances are good that it's a, that's a, it's a it's a scam yep. most places won't require you to change a password even if it if if it's auto expiring it won't request you to change a password until you go to log in the next time right so that's a, a big thing to, to remember. Like if people, if, if, a, if a website is, is saying you need to reset your password, it's probably a scam. Yeah. When in doubt, just open up a browser, type in the website address yourself and go to it and try to log in. If you can't, you'll most likely get instructions that your password has to be reset or something has to happen, but you've put the address in yourself. Yeah. That way you're not relying on that link that could send you elsewhere without you even knowing it using some various techniques. And the next thing you know, you're at a, a website you don't want to be at and you're putting your credentials in and now bad guys got all your stuff and away they go. And when it comes to that kind of stuff too, you know, just make sure that, you know, you're looking to, if you're using something like Chrome, look to the left of the address bar and make sure that you see a padlock and not like not secure. Um, there's extensions you can get for Chrome, like HTTPS everywhere, which basically forces um, secure browsing oh, man. At, yeah. at all the sites, right? So that's just something that other example of stuff that you can do. Yeah, it's 2020. Use secure socket layer SSL yeah. encryption. It's not very good encryption, but it is better than no encryption. Yep. yep. You don't want all your stuff out there in plain text. Terrible. Oh, I, I I'm with uh, I'm with Hughes. I really like HTTPS everywhere yep. as a plugin. Most modern browsers, Chrome and Firefox, both support different versions of HTTPS everywhere, which just force the URL. Um, Auto completion stuff to happen with the SSL enabled, which yep. you you should be using SSL because it's the current year. Yep. Yeah. Ever, I'm actually has, thinking about um, now that you're talking about browsers switching over to Firefox from Chrome just because of the added security features that Firefox has come up with. Uh, Fire, yeah, so Firefox I think is is one of the more secure browsers. Certainly the most mainstream browser that um, is security conscious. There are. Uh, more secure, but also more obscure browsers. So you'll see less support, fewer plugins, less themes, smaller user communities. So if you run into problems, it may be more difficult to figure mm -hmm. out what broke. 
Uh, but Firefox is very large and very well supported by Mozilla. Let's so uh, uh, talk about VPNs for a minute. Um, that's something that's pretty hot. You see ads for it all the time. Um, yep. and, and, you know, it's right. It used to be recommended for if you wanted to get around, uh, you know, not being able to access Netflix.com. Um, and, 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 you know, if you're going to be doing things like torrents so that your ISP wouldn't be able to package shape what you're doing and basically yep. throttle you. Um, but there's a lot of advantages, advantages to it as well, but it's also not the be all end all of security, understanding, you know, who owns that VPN service that you're subscribing to where the exit nodes are. Um, and even things like, um, you know, on the, on the service themselves. So they have hard drives or they run the operating systems off CD ROM. So they don't have logs. So those are all things to consider when you're looking at those services. And I, I don't know if you guys, I mean, obviously you guys would use them, but if there's any that you would recommend to the listeners, cause I mean, if you search Google for a VPN service, you're probably going to find a thousand of them. Right? So, a yeah. lot of times. And a lot of them just and want to steal your data. <laughs> they do. So definitely, yeah. If they offer it for free, they're it's stealing not your for data. You. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So, right. Don't. So automatically yeah. let's not subscribe to free VPNs because yeah. they're not. Yeah. And then, when you're considering a VPN provider, you want to find out whether or not they maintain logging and at what level. You want somebody that has no logging ever under any circumstances. Yep. And there have been VPN providers recently um, in the last couple of months that have been um, outed for maintaining logs despite having publicly said for years that they don't. So. There is, uh, there is some due diligence required by you as a consumer to go and do some Googling and find out if they're a reputable VPN vendor or not. There's also other considerations around VPN. Um, the exit nodes, particularly what countries they're in or what data centers in what country they're in. Um, also, what level of encryption and what type of encryption they use. You have to use their utility. Can you use a product like OpenVPN and plug in your connection information do they have a limited number of seats? So is it, are you paying for one, one seat that you can use? Or are you paying for multiple devices to be used simultaneously? And there's a bunch of use cases around that. If I were going to pick one, I would recommend the one that I have been using for years, which is private internet access. Yep. PIA. I think it's PIA. like, yeah, I think it's like 50 bucks a year, us 40 bucks a year, us it's somewhere in that range. And I believe they allow for three simultaneous users, yep. which is fine. Cause I use my, computer and my phone so you're good so more than more than adequate for my needs and exit nodes all over the bloody place uh, a dozen in the u.s and a couple in different places in canada and another dozen in different european countries and uh, i'm a big fan of private internet access they also um have a very very large well-documented support community so you can do a lot of stuff with their services. If you don't want to use their proprietary utility, you can plug in all of your connection information into your own utility like OpenVPN uh, or some other third-party tool, and you can use that, that connection to use your virtual private network to do the things that you want to do. I'm a big fan of looking at cat photos on the internet, but nobody else needs to know which cat photos I like, so <laughs> they want to see they have to work for it. Yep. Is that so when I was Sorry? mentioning about uh, VPNs, um, you know, you have to be careful about like device fingerprinting, which is which is obviously um, something to consider. Um, so understand that a VPN will not be a hundred percent anonymous, but it's a step in the right direction, right? So, yeah. it, well, and that's the thing is it is it it's going to make uh, a specific threat vector work harder to attack you. It's not going to stop you from being attacked. And it's not going to stop you from being uh, specifically attacked. If someone wants to get your data, they will find a, an attack vector to get your data. But this will reduce the chances of uh, drive-bys, if you will. It, it's less of a general attack, um, sort of like phishing versus spear phishing. The, it's less likely that they're going to go to that much work for your stuff when they can do no work and get somebody else's because they're just looking for data. They're not looking for your data, unless it's specifically about you and in that case, we have other bigger problems that we need to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To think of it as, you know, you're, you're sitting at like the local coffee shop, the Timmy's, the Starbucks or whatever, you're connected to their Wi-Fi. your VPN, all your information is encrypted to that VPN provider. 
the guy sitting a couple tables over from you because COVID and you got to be that distance now, um, isn't running a VPN at all and is sending all their information over that Wi-Fi hotspot. If they're just looking for information, they're going to go for the guy a couple tables over because they've most likely taken over the Wi-Fi hotspot already. They're aggregating all the data. They can't see yours. They take a lot of work to see yours, but the guy sitting a couple tables over from you, their information is just free flowing. So they're going to grab all that and ignore you. It's all about getting information that's readily available and easy to access. Because like Andrew said earlier, programmers are lazy. Hackers tend to be lazy usually as well. They'll go after the easy target unless they're looking for something very specific. Then yeah, they're going to work harder for it. But that's another thing I was going to say too. Is I mean, if you have an opportunity to not use free uh, Wi-Fi when it comes to like McDonald's or Starbucks or anything, don't. If you have your own hotspot, whether it be on your phone or an actual device, use that. You're always going to be better off using your own internet than free Wi-Fi. Um, if you can't and you have to use the public Wi-Fi, just make sure you've got some level of protection, i.e., a VPN. To Eric's point, um, you know, it's just going to make your data that much harder to look at. And everyone around you is probably not going to be using a VPN. So their stuff is a lot easier to get to, right? So the uh, I, I agree with that. The other VPN that I might mention to you listeners to look at is uh, Nord. They have a pretty solid reputation. Yeah, they're pretty so popular. Those would be my, my two deal, sort of top choices. Yeah, yeah Nord, they, Nord, I think, is a very reasonable um, private internet access uh, suits me as someone who is more involved in this and likes to fiddle with things under the hood. So I, I like being able to tweak all the settings and change my encryption keys and my handshake policies, but that's, that's not necessarily something everybody wants to mess with. That's yep. the one thing I noticed with Nord is they don't have that granularity when it comes to security of the things that you nope, can change. But when it less... comes to speed, having that, you know, I've got a gigabit connection. Uh, Nord is actually a lot closer to gigabit speeds when I'm connected uh, versus PIA, but that's just uh, preference. But with, with Nord as well, you can go over, you can have a VPN over the Tor network on top of it yep. uh, to make things even a little bit more difficult. Because I wanted to ask you guys about Tor. <laughs> I don't think we have enough time. Off, <laughs> well, let's say it's often confused with private, uh, with uh, VPNs, with virtual yes. private networks. Yeah. Because it's two totally different things. Seems like it should be, but also it is definitely not. Yeah. It's not, but you can route your VPN through Tor. Um, which, yes, you, you can yeah, route your yeah. VPN traffic through Tor, which is a whole, like, this is where we get into the yeah. under the hood bit. Um, Tor is another one of those things that you should look into and see if it meets your needs. And this is like a Cavet mTOR kind of a thing, like buyer beware. Tor's free. But it's a free open source project. There's not a company behind it, although theoretically somebody could be gathering your data. So do you want to pass your data through this? The trade off is that you're accepting somebody else's data back. So you could, in theory, do things with that if you wanted to and had the know how, which if you do, you don't need me to describe how Tor works. <laughs> For everyone else, you might want to go and look at Tor. It's the Onion Router, T-O-R, uh, the Onion Router. And every user is also an endpoint for the network. And it basically just takes all of your traffic and flip-flops it around inside of the Onion Router network. So if, if Hughes and I are both using it, some of my traffic will go through Hughes's computer and some of his traffic will come through mine. And there are hundreds of thousands of users like that, so it'll route it all over the place, and it makes it very difficult for uh, for an attacker to find out where specific track, uh, where specific traffic originated from. doesn't make it impossible. It just Vibrate. makes it a lot more difficult. So it sounds, another one of those like, things uh, it sounds a whole lot like Napster. It just doesn't sound like it's going to go well. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very much a peer-to-peer -peer type service like it's that same kind of distributed computing type Except thing Napster uh, is a great way to give your computer aids for a few few songs right so <laughs> yeah Guys, Tor, Tor's I'm, not going to do anything s weird af after all of this and we're almost an hour into this i'm buying yep. a typewriter i'm <laughs> yeah. reconnecting my landline and that's about it like this, this is uh, uh, i'm uh, i'm with uncle ted i'm gonna get a cabin and a typewriter and i'm gonna live in the woods yeah Perfect. um 
<laughs> because I have very little else to contribute to this conversation, um, I'm going to mention the the security things that I know about, which includes keys. Um, all of your car keys, by the way, are completely hackable. Um, any of your RFID cards, if you've got a, a path, like a, a, a prox card that gets you into your office, um, also entirely hackable and copyable without any trace of it having been copied. Um, so some yeah. of those car keys can actually be copied through a wall. So even if it's, um, if, if your key is near enough to your outside wall, then it can be, uh, um, it can be copied without, again, through a wall without anybody knowing it, they just get in your car and drive off. Um, yep. so just keep, you know, things to keep in mind. Um, it's maybe not a bad idea to keep, uh, keep your spare keys locked away in a metal box wherein they cannot be, uh, or they're, they're less likely to be, um, like a Faraday cage <laughs> uh, or, or I was going to say our fire safe, but you know, <laughs> yes, a, 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 fire, a fire safe that's, uh, that's, that's got a, that has, that happens to have a ground wire attached to it makes an excellent Faraday cage. I've seen the attacks, even um, they were publishing security video on YouTube of people walking up to a house and basically capturing that key code and yeah. then within seconds starting yep. a car. Yeah. And it's like, listen, if you're going to go through that level of effort, you can just have the car. You know, I'll yeah, my insurance, my insurance is going to replace it, but it's, just, it's more of an inconvenience than anything. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, it is a thing. It's not a bad idea to, um, to, to do that. Um, especially within the prepper community, there are a lot of, there are a lot of really popular pictures such as doing pocket dumps. Um, do yourself a favor. Don't put a picture of your keys on the internet. Um, I, it's really low. It's, it's not necessarily cyber attack, but if I can get access to that picture, I can make a copy of that key. Um, and I can get it, I'll get, I'll get it right about 85% of the time on the first try. And within three tries, I'll have it the other 15%. Like it's, it's really not hard. So just uh, security by obscurity. If people aren't looking for your stuff and they can't, they don't have access to your stuff, then you're less likely to be a target. What I want to say is, if you're going to post a picture of your keys, make sure you use like something like KeySmart, where you're actually hiding the bidding on the key. Yeah, even the keyway, right? The, the bidding and the keyway are are, are both uh, are both important important combinations. Um, yeah. Just don't put pictures of that. I mean, it, it, again, it's about it's about being as a, as, as gray as possible. And I mean, if you go back to the gray man episode that we did back, I don't know, 30 episodes ago or so, right? Like if, even just, if I know that you have a, um, if I know that you drive a Dodge or a, or a Chrysler product because of the key that you have, then when it comes time to actually go make a copy of that key that I want to, it's one less thing I have to try and figure out at the time. And so it's a faster process because I already have that, concept sorted out. So I just show up and I've already got those tools ready to go. So I think with, with everything we talked, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, yes. I was going to say with, with everything we talk about, I think it's, it's, you have to look at it. Like for my, my mindset, it's, it's, you know, like PPGP, like pretty good uh, security, right? Or that's PGS, I'm sorry, but like pretty good security, pretty good private uh, privacy. You have to f strike a balance between uh, being as secure as you can and being a usable system, right? Because yeah. if I need three different things in three different locations to access my bank account every time, that's going to be a pain in the butt, right? And not that I'm not going to do it as often, but so it's really trying to find a balance between the level of security that you need um, and the usability of, of things, right? I mean, I still have a Gmail account. I still have an Android device. I run Kali Linux on my laptops and all that kind of stuff. So it's finding that balance for what works for you. Um, I, I, I think that's what it comes down to, right? So, I mean, Absolutely. you can be really, really, really secure, but you won't be able to use anything uh, or, 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 uh, readily, or you can be wide open and you're just going to get hacked nonstop. Or, yeah. Yeah. And, pay, and pay attention to what's changed in your life yeah. uh, so that you know that you have been attacked, right? Um, there are a whole bunch of like free credit monitor, well, free or um, you are the subject of advertising as a result of a credit monitoring process. So you know if somebody's tried to open a new credit card in your name and okay. it'll give you an uh, alert yeah, for that. Yes, with one expansion. Check in with your bank because a number of Canadian banks have recently started offering uh, credit checking services as a feature on some of their accounts. Yep. Depending yeah, on the, the tier and bank. the bank. Scotia Bank has it. I think um, CIBC has it. CIBC does as well. Yep, and I believe yeah. RBC does as well. So, depending on your bank, and I believe it's based on the tier of service that you pay for, um, you may have access to that through your banking, which I would recommend 
far and away over using a free service. Yep. Absolutely. Other thing is, is I mean, it's it's you know they're offering this to protect themselves as well, right? Because Absolutely. if somebody were to take credit, um, you know, from f- credit out of your name, it affects your credit, affects the bank's uh, bottom line as well. And a lot of what we have is unsecured credit. So at, in the end, it's the banks that have to eat it. So it's a good service that, that they're offering. Yep. And if you're curious, uh, if you've been involved in one of those data breaches, you can go over to haveibeenpwned.com. That's P-W-N-E-D. And it'll let you know if your email address has popped up in any of the data breaches or any of the, the documents that have been released. And it will have. And it will have. 100% it will happen. If you've been on the internet for more than five minutes, it will have. Yeah. Somebody has made a poor security choice at some point. 100%. Because again, but it, programmers are lazy. Yep. But it'll give you kind of an idea as to what sites you're using. And if you're using that same password still on that site that's listed, start changing your passwords. Because inevitably somebody is going to run an attack on a site and try to get in and... So, so check that out for sure. Please, and, please use unique passwords. Yes, please. If there's any takeaway from this unique episode, passwords. unique passwords for everything is key. It's going to make life so much more difficult for people to get into your accounts. And please change the passwords, your default passwords on all your Internet of Things, um, your your security cameras, your routers, anything at your house that has shown up from a retail shop will come with a default username and password for login for administrative access. Please change that password. Um, you mean admin admin is not a secure? <laughs> or admin pass or, yeah. you know, net gear, net gear. Or root pass root pass. is usually yeah. not. Yeah, no, root, root, not. Terrible, I mean, terrible. You know, talking about that just quickly, like for routers, you can take it a step further. I mean, you know, you can hide the SSID. That's not, that's not the be all end all. You can have MAC yeah. address filtering as well. Um, you know, so you can filter what the what devices are allowed or not allowed on your network. Um, you know, you can take it that step further. And again, it, it comes down to the usability aspect. If a friend of mine comes over and wants to use my my network, I've got a separate guest network that's in a DMZ that they can use. Um, but I'm not going to give them access to my network because you know, one, the SSID is hidden, and I'd have to unrestrict or I'd have to allow their MAC address on my network and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, just think about the usability aspect yeah. of it, right? So now, to counter that, if you hide the SSID, it's not necessarily hard to find it if you want to. But for the average guy driving by, just looking for SSIDs, yeah, they're going to drive by. Yeah, yeah, the war drivers are probably going to find it still. But it's an extra step, right? And don't use the same email address for everything, too. Absolutely. That's another one. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm bad for that. There's a couple of people that I work with that we have vendor specific email addresses, so we can tell if somebody has decided to sell our accounts to a third party. So if I start getting like Amazon at Andrew.ca, and I start getting emails from not Amazon, I know that they've been sharing my email with other parties, and so usually that results in a series of angry emails. You guys are tricked for that. So I have a separate Gmail mailbox um, for all my spam. So basically anytime I sign up, if, if I'm at a store yeah. and they're like, you know, what's your, what, what's your email address? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I give them the email address and then it's basically plus the name of the store. So if you do like, let's say my email address was Hughes at gmail.com, I would do Hughes plus Old Navy at gmail.com. And what that plus does is it creates a separate unique email address that goes into the same mailbox. So to Andrew's point, if I know that I'm getting a bunch of spam from Hughes plus old Navy at gmail.com. I know that old Navy leaked my email address or old Navy sold my email address. Um, so it's just a good idea to, to have that as well. Good idea. Um, antivirus. You know, if you want to install it and make yourself feel a warm and fuzzy, sure. Yeah, Is it really after. needed these days? Is it? I mean, some protection is yeah. probably better than no protection. Cause you're yeah. still going to get a bunch of like, I was on the internet and for some reason I now have this pop-up that won't go away. And this woman on my desktop keeps flashing me. I fail to see the problem. How do I get that? I'll tell you that. That was probably, that was probably 15 years ago, but I used to work as tech um, Mm -hmm. fixing computers and we would have machines coming all the time. And I don't know why this thing keeps telling me to go to this website. Then she walks across the screen and takes her top off. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And you're real upset about that too. It'll be 140 bucks though. Thanks. (laughs) I'm more upset about the bill than they are about what was happening. Uh, The best idea are the ones that would come in and have like literally 17 search bars in internet explorer. And it would take me, you know, like two hours to just like, unroot all of these search bars. Uh, oftentimes I just tell the customer, listen, I'm just going to back up your stuff 
wipe your heart down again. We're just gonna and go, it's just, gonna be it's just new, it's gonna be just start again. Yep, and they're it's, back next month. Better, same thing. Same thing. Yeah, yep. yeah. My search bar and all these. Yeah. I wasted many hours the tech doing the exact same thing. <laughs> I, yeah, I did well, I mean, that's the nature of the work. Although things seem to have matured with the uh, the current version of Windows, and that was never as big of a deal with the Mac OS as it would just fewer users, not as profitable, less of a vector of attack. So if if you're going to connect it to the internet, it's probably worth putting an antivirus and keeping it up to date. It's also probably worth having at least a software firewall, even if it's the built-in one and Windows turned on, because it's at least going to cut down on the like the the noise attacks like the the general broadcast like uh hey are you listening oh you are cool let me send you some traffic see what happens right so like at least you're cutting down on on the jet like the very generalized attacks yep. it's still not going to stop specific threat vectors so if somebody is targeting you the antivirus firewall none of that's going to affect that that is i i have much more um invasive means of attack the other thing but too I think turn, is, sorry you go ahead Andrew. oh i just turn on turn on the basics so that we're at least in a a less exposed position yeah. i was yeah. going to say in terms of uh networking as well a lot of isps like uh bell and eastlink here on the east coast they offer obviously routers built into the modem and and wireless access points built into the modem um, but don't don't do that. And you know, if you can skip out on the forty dollar dealing router from Best Buy, um, if you're going to get a little bit serious about your home networking gear, look at the Unify gear, something like a Dream Machine, uh, which is more for the home users, or a Dream Machine Pro, which is stepping up the game a little bit. Um, you know, these routers cost nice, anywhere from four <laughs> to five hundred dollars, nice. but it's you know very very nice equipment um and and it's it's in terms of firewalls you, you really can't beat it as, at, at least for what's on the consumer uh, market yeah. right this is this is more like a pro prosumer type gear i can't confirm uh, or deny I mean, running yeah, unify <laughs> i also have unify equipment and cannot recommend them highly enough but i feel like it's a step beyond your your average consumer I, I feel like it's even a step beyond most of your prosumers. Like that's somebody who likes to tinker, tinker with this yeah. stuff and have high end gear because it's like talking to a car guy, right? Like he likes to have a nice car and he likes to work on his car. Talking to a network guy and you start talking about the ubiquity products. And it's like, well, that's a guy who likes to build networks and likes to play with stuff and wants to tweak this. So he doesn't mind having a $500 firewall, no. but uh, your, your mom who wants to check her Facebook account probably not going to need that be fun to set it up for her though oh yeah 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 yeah. if you talk her into it sure (laughs) but i i feel like a lot of people that's going to be um that's going to be far and away the level of effort that they're going to put into it and we do have a a good question here in the live chat from josh uh just in regards to uh, concerns of smart tvs uh, being connected to the internet is there any way to secure them great question Mm. don't connect them to the internet was yeah. in the kitchen the other day. Told my wife a joke. She laughed. I laughed. The toaster laughed. I shot the toaster. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah. smart TVs um, are tricky. IoT. I mean, just yeah. smart TVs, Google Nest products, Amazon Alexa products, your phone. I mean, it's connected to the internet and it's listening to you or watching yeah. you. Yep. Or it's connected to a thing where there's somebody... That can be watching you. Hi, CSIS. Looking yep. at you guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like we bought a Samsung washer and dryer two years ago, and it, you know, the first thing that popped up was the washer wanted to connect to the internet. No, I don't think so. No, that's that there's thing's nothing never you can getting tell me that. I, yeah. That thing's yeah. never getting patched. No, no. wide no. open. <laughs> no, yeah. not happening. So I, I mean, smart TVs, I think, are not. Um, not particularly scary, although they are definitely a vector of attack. They there has been a number of smart TVs that have been exposed as uh, being reasonably easy to access their sound and video systems remotely. Just again, sort of that broad general attack. Go out on the internet and send a message and see what answers, and then start sending it traffic and see what it does. And there's a number of TVs in the last couple of years that have had problems with that because again. Like Eric said the vendors are not very good at keeping on top of security patching and not very good at pushing patches or relies on the consumer to apply the patches. Yep. So maybe the vendor's putting them out, but they're not auto updating. Nobody's listening. 
right? So I don't know that smart TVs are particularly scary because if you have a, a Google Home Mini, it listens to you all the time, and it's just as easy for, uh, for an interested third party to access as your smart TV is. So my, I don't know that it's... My Samsung listens to me. There's no question about it. We were, you know, we'll, we'll talk about something and I'll start getting ads for it. Like we'll talk like amongst ourselves sitting on the deck, drinking beers and start getting ads. We'll all start getting ads for it afterwards. Like it's, it's a, there's no question your electronics are listening to you. Yeah. Plain and well, simple. and I think there's a difference between if my, my, my phone, for example, that's running Facebook is listening to me. And now I get a targeted ad for my next vacation. Cause I was just talking to my wife about going on vacation. There's a difference between that and, um, an interested malicious third party that wants to listen to my conversation because I might say something incriminating or revealing. Yep. Huge difference in the two. Right. And, and part of that, I think there's the trade off that as a consumer, you accept that these devices are going to be eavesdropping on you. I think eavesdropping is the, the best way to describe it, but an interested third party that wanted to have access to this to see your living room, or we, we had this problem again, this is, it was probably going back two or three years, and I think it was VTech, but uh, it might have been another brand. I think it was VTech. Um, baby monitors are super, VTech. super easy to access. So, because everything, all, all baby monitors basically use admin. Admin is like an internet password, so you can just log into any baby monitor you want, and then you can like creepily watch children sleeping or playing in their nursery or so on and so forth, and pipe that video all over the world if you feel so inclined, and there were there were a lot of problems a couple of years ago with that sort of technology, and it's not vastly different than your smart TV problem that we're that yep. we started this on. Any of those devices, really any device, is not going to be that difficult to access if somebody feels motivated enough. And there are groups of people who break into these for fun and then post the instructions on the internet because it's a hobby, just like Locksport is. Or if you want a search engine similar to Google for all the connected devices that are accessible just check out Shodan. they're all there creepy yeah but you can watch some guys living room if you want and some creepy. people are probably okay with that but yep. other people not, might not be so i don't want anybody looking well, in my living room question similar to a vpn is there anything that i could plug in kind of between my wi-fi router and my internet access whatever it may be that would protect everything that's connected to my wi-fi is that a, a thing? very aggressive firewall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, um, you're getting into some technical setups for sure there. But yeah, I, it, yeah it's possible. But I mean, for Not simplicity's easy. sake, if you don't want people to do it, don't have internet connected devices in your home. But I mean, you also have the pocket spy, you know, your, your mobile phone. Yep. So you probably already have an internet connected device with you everywhere you go anyway. Absolutely. And it's already listening to you. And there may be some, uh, let's call them third-party actors. They might be non-state actors. They might be state actors. Who knows? Yeah. Um, who are already monitoring or surveilling you in some way through those devices, whether it's surreptitiously sending you advertisements or waiting for you to reveal your plans for world domination. Yeah, I think world domination is just really aggressive. Like, why do I need to control the whole world? Like, just one little part of it would be fine. Uh, just aim high, <laughs> and, and I feel I feel like based on some of the podcasts that I've been on and some of the things that I listen to, I'm on enough lists that that's probably accurate. People are listening. Basically, well, with I, your I electronic don't... devices, just always assume that somebody's listening and take steps to try to circumvent it. Right? Yeah, it, it just depends on how radical you want yeah. to be. Because I mean, some people might look to Uncle Ted and go live in the woods with a typewriter and write a. A, a series of uh, novels other okay. other people might might not want to do that there's a balance to be had there somewhere yeah it's it's an interesting balancing act when it comes to electronics and privacy is in order to use them you have to put information in but at the same time that information once it's out there is out there so it, it's a it's a fine balancing act on how you contain that information how you allow it to leave um, where you let it go to and how it's dealt with and who has access to it. And sometimes you just, you can't control it. Once it's out there, it's out there. And you just got to cross your fingers and hope it doesn't fall into a nefarious hands, but there's times where it does. And so it's an interesting this, world. This of is, 
sort of the problem with all all electronic communication, all all computer systems, whether it's your phone or a physical computer or your your new seventy two inch smart TV curve screen doodad from Best Buy. You want to use it. They want to sell you another one or they want to sell somebody else your information so you buy another whatever the next product is. So you just bought a TV, maybe you need a new dishwasher or maybe, you know, maybe the people that make the TikTok videos want to give your information to the Chinese Communist Party. These are also possibilities. So yep. it's, a, it's a trade-off with what you're, what you're going to accept as a consumer because there are ways to get around most of this and still use computers but it requires you to make more of a full-time job of how do you use a computer without revealing any personal information. It can be done. Absolutely. But it's a yeah. real big pain Seems in like the ass. It seems like a lot of work. Yeah. It's it a lot is of a lot to of remember. Things. Yeah, it certainly is. And it's a lot of knowledge and understanding how they work. Or it's a lot of having trust in somebody that tells you they know how that might not necessarily know and then your information is still leaked. So it's... Yeah, it boils down to, to a balancing act and, and researching and then coming up with a plan as far as what you're comfortable with doing and understanding the repercussions of what can happen with the information you put out there. There you go. Yeah. So maybe we'll just do a quick wrap up because that's a lot of information thrown out. Uh, for those trying to just get into this and trying to kind of navigate through some ways that they can secure themselves a little bit more online, check out VPNs, uh, PIA or Nord. It's going to be a good starting point for you as far as securing your connection when you're out and about coffee shop, hotels, at home. Um, check out two-factor authentication or 2FA. Come up with a device like a YubiKey or something and start enabling that on your individual accounts online. And look at all your accounts and change your passwords. Don't use the same password on every account. So your your login for Facebook is different for your, your password for Google. It's different for your password for Amazon. Is it a pain to do that and set it up initially? Absolutely. Is Are you going to be smashing your head against the desk for the first couple of weeks that you've done that because you've forgotten what the password is for Amazon or Facebook? Most likely. Well, that's where a password manager comes into play. Uh, so we've listed off a couple. They'll help uh, in managing the passwords and, and saving and storing the, the different passwords for your different access accounts. Um, pick one that you are comfortable with, but keep in mind that that master password that you use to access them is going to be your weak point. So if somebody breaks into that, then they have access to all of your passwords and all of your logins. Um, so that's where you build in your two-factor authentication for those accounts and for your password manager. But the, the big take home here. If you are a target for whatever reason and somebody wants to get your information and they're determined to do it, they're going to get it. It's just a matter of time. It, it might be that 400 years that Andrew uh, said earlier about password cracking. It might be the next couple of days. It might be a couple of years. Uh, but if they've targeted you for some unknown reason, they're going to gain access. But the, the number one way that they're going to gain access is through physical um, hands-on of the actual devices that you have. Um, so keep those close to you, lock and key. Um, people that you don't know should not have access to them, period. Because it doesn't take much to throw something on there. It'll start grabbing your information and sending it back um, to their their systems. And then they have access to all your stuff. So I think that's a pretty quick recap of, of everything we, we talked about. Did I miss anything, guys? Buy a typewriter, live in the woods. Make sure nobody steals the tape from the typewriter. Yeah. Burn yeah. the tapes when they're done. Yeah. Keep your typewriter locked up too. Keep a shredder beside your typewriter so you can type everything out and then shred it. Yeah. Burn after reading. Perfect. How will anyone read my memoir? What would mm -hmm. Uncle Ted say? That's a good uh, question. Something to do with a Wango Tango and shotgun a beer, kill a badger. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move into the podcast challenge then, shall we? Re-listen to this episode 17 times until you actually understand all of it. Line up all the ones and zeros, and then it will make sense. Uh, but um, for, the, for the challenge, uh, look over all of your online accounts. If they support two-factor authentication or 2FA, enable it. Come up with a way to utilize that two-factor authentication. Uh, like we've mentioned in the podcast, using text message or using email as your 2FA is probably not the wisest choice but balance that with 
uh, how probable you believe a, a threat uh, vector is going to be against you, uh, and then select the appropriate two-factor authentication, uh, and then change all of your passwords to separate passwords, which is going to be most likely a, a huge pain to do. But once it's done, if one account is breached, your other accounts are technically still safe, but at least all the passwords are different. So you're going to make it trickier for an attacker. So look over your online accounts, set up two-factor authentication, change all your passwords. We'll see you in about 17 episodes. It's a lot. Uh, That's a lot of work. Podcast complete. It's a, work. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. But if you if you start at it and just do a couple a day, you'll eventually get through it, and, and then you'll be a little more secure for it. So. Uh, upcoming events. Uh, we have TechCom 2020, uh, which is now going to be taking place in 2021 for security because no one suspects no one suspects TechCom 2020 to happen in 2021. Uh -huh. uh, you can see the details and get tickets for the show at the link in our show notes. Uh, give them uh, give them a reason to have the have the event. Go buy your tickets. Right, and we've got uh, attend a Maple Seed event. So if you check out uh, MapleSeedRifleMen.com. And there's a link in the show notes as well. If you're wondering what the heck is that, uh, there's a YouTube video there for you, so you can check that out. So we'll move to some shout outs. So I see it's, anybody else have one or is it just me tonight? Uh, I think it's just you. All right, so just a quick shout out to uh, all the listeners that have uh, either gone through our Amazon link or uh, signed up to be a Patreon. You're helping uh, keep the show going, uh, The having the generator fueled and the, back, uh, the lights going. Uh, so far, we've raised thirty dollars through uh, Amazon links. Uh, pretty good, considering we just mentioned them last episode, and uh, we're up to seventeen dollars a month for for uh, Patreon. So appreciate that. Uh, costs about four hundred bucks or so a year to, to run this. So um, a little bit here and there helps out quite a bit. So buy thanks for everybody. Yeah, buy the t-shirts. All right, we will move into some uh, email and iTunes reviews then. Looks like we got a few this year. We've this got week. a couple. So uh, we've got one from uh, Grumpy Prepper, and this is via uh, Apple Podcasts in the United States. Uh, so it says, despite their glaring Canadiosity, uh, these guys put on a great podcast, fun and informative. It's moved into my top three uh, prep casts. Well, appreciate that. Despite the glaring Canadianosity or because yeah. of the Canadian glaring, the uh, glaring Canadianosity. Wow, I, that's a hard word to say. I didn't think it was going to be that take tough. Take off. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hoser. Yeah, jeez. Uh, we've got another one uh, from Joey's Girl 1981. Uh, this was from Apple Podcast Canada. And it says, I enjoy listening in large because it's Canadian. Uh, all the hosts are knowledgeable and, uh, the, and live the lifestyle. I like the added touch of news updates and the accountability of living the lifestyle of sharing what they've done for preparedness. So appreciate that. Thanks for the review. Now, is there any chance that Joey's Girl 1981 is in any way related to Jesse's Girl 1977? Perhaps. Younger sister. Maybe. Ah. <laughs> Uh, and as far as emails go, uh, I can confirm that the inbox is working. We have had uh, multiple emails from listeners because um, we put out there uh, last episode that we're looking for some topic ideas. So uh, we've had some roll in. So appreciate it and uh, keep them coming in because we are adding it to our list of topic ideas. So appreciate all the, uh, the brainstorming from the listeners. We do appreciate that. Makes our job a whole lot easier oh, and, and worthwhile. I mean, it's it's great yeah. to know that we're not just talking amongst ourselves. Yeah, we can come up with ideas all day long, but we don't always know that it's what people want to hear. So uh, if you send the ideas in, at least we know one person wants to hear it, and chances are that means multiple people want to hear it. So. Theoretically. Yeah. And we had a message in the Facebook inbox as well from Josh. It just says, uh, hey, guys, love the podcast. Uh, I listen to you guys as I weld the day away. Uh, I hope to buy my first house and really start prepping. Uh, the last episode on solar power was great and very informative and changed my perspective on solar for the better. Uh, you've been asking for show ideas, and I think I have a few for you free of charge. So appreciate that because then he went on to list a, a whole bunch of ideas. So I didn't Thanks, charge a dime for them. So Thanks, Josh. We love you too. Yeah, so appreciate it. So lots of good feedback. So that always makes things fun as well. We know people are listening and they're getting something out of the show. So. Appreciate that. 
And uh, with that, I will bring episode number 83 of the Canadian Prepper Podcast to an end. Uh, you can find the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, or of course your favorite podcast app. Uh, please help us out, submit a review. It helps other people find us. We do record these shows live on Facebook and YouTube if you'd like an early peek at the show. Uh, hit up our YouTube channel, Canadian Prepper Podcast, and click the notifications tab. It gives you an alert when we're going live. If you want to find me directly, I'm on Instagram at PPSWO. Every once in a while, I, I post things that I'm doing there. Or by email, alan at prepperpodcast.ca, although I will admit that I've not checked that email recently since the password that Eric's set up for that is like 37 characters long. I can't remember it. I had it written down somewhere. It no longer exists. So I've, I've had to go to the, uh, go to the admin and have it reset. And um, yeah, that's, that's another topic entirely. That's where uh, last pass comes into play. There we go. So that's, that's how you can reach us or reach me. Uh, for myself, I can be reached at hfxprepper at gmail.com. I also have my own YouTube channel. Just search for hfxprepper. And yes, I promise I will get more videos up soon. Promise. Andrew, where can everybody find you? If you've enjoyed listening to me, you can do more of that. 257 episodes deep at Canadian Patriot Podcast. I've been on at least 250 of those. Impressive. Kind of my show. It's important that I'm there. We're uh, usually live Mondays and Wednesdays on the YouTube, but you can find us anywhere that fine podcasts are distilled for your listening enjoyment. <laughs> All right. And uh, you can check out Rapid Survival at rapidsurvival.com. Uh, you can get me there in the live chat while you're buying some prepper gear. You can also email me at feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. So uh, thanks for joining us this evening. And until next time, be prepared, stay safe. Be fine. Thank you.